If you haven't been with us, War of the Worldviews is our yearly project. We've been talking about the battle that we are in for our country at a spiritual level. Our enemies are not, are not flesh and blood. Uh, our enemy is spiritual, actually a philosophy, a worldview that's opposed to the biblical worldview. And we talked about what is truth last week, and I want to go forward with the pursuit of truth tonight and begin with something that Jesus said to his disciples near the end of his earthly ministry. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them or hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. This is something we read and right past it. But think about this. Jesus has been with these guys for over three years. At this point, he taught them so many things. And here he says, I've got a lot more to teach you, but you can't hear them now, meaning you can't take everything I want to say to you all at once. You see that? I can't give it all to you. I can't give you all the truth at once. But I will send the spirit of truth so that you can spend the rest of your life in pursuit of the truth. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. Now, of course, we know he was referring to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the church. But I believe we might have missed something in the meaning here. I believe this is, you know, we think of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, speaking in tongues, gifts of the Spirit. That's fine. It's appropriate. But I wonder if we think also about the Holy Spirit as the one who is sent to guide us into all truth. We might be missing something there. In other words, to lifelong learning as a disciple. Let me say it another way. The big idea of this message, one of the first one is, nothing identifies the true followers of Jesus Christ more than their commitment to a lifelong pursuit of truth. A lifelong pursuit. Commitment to the pursuit of truth. You know, people are pursuing all kinds of things out there. People are pursuing their passions, power, sex, pleasure. But truly born-again believers have a different value system. They are pursuing the truth. Josh McDowell, who I love his ministry, said, When all is said and done, there is no pursuit more worthy than following the truth wherever it may lead. In this war of the worldviews, the bad news is that lying and falsehood are all around us these days. You can't trust the media. You can't trust the politicians. In some cases, the ministers to be telling you the truth. But the good news is that God has hardwired us for truth. The search for truth is a mark of maturity in a person. Josh McDowell went on to say, once we arrive at a certain time in our lives, discerning and finding the truth becomes the inevitable focus. Humanity's search for answers can only be found in the truth. Life must be grounded in reality. You know, when I consider the culture today, I'm amazed at how much Americans are fascinated with fantasy. Uh, You know, I don't go to the movies much anymore. There is one out now I want to see, D'Souza's new movie. I want to go see that. I heard it's great. But there's really not a lot to see. But when I do go, inevitably, I sit through 15 or 20 minutes of trailers or previews of coming attractions, and I'm always amazed. I mean, I watch one of these after another, and I say, who wants to see this? I mean, it's, it's nothing but, uh, uh, you know, more superhero movies, uh, which are all fantasy. 
uh, science fiction, space invasions, the never-ending movies that are nothing more than a series of explosion, bombs, car wrecks, blow-ups, you know, gunfights. And this is, you know, when I said, well, who wants to see this? The Lord says the American people want to see it. That's why they make them. They're not making them because nobody's going to see them. This is what people want. And I believe they're losing themselves in a fantasy world instead of seeking the truth. Now, I, don't, look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I enjoy at times a, a certain fling of, of, of fantasy. I mean, I like, you know, all the men, Superman, Batman. I love Spider-Man. But I mean, you, you folks, you, let's face it. Life's worth more than that. Life's about more than that. Uh, you know, it, the word cinema, did you know this? In French, means distraction. To go to the cinema is to go to the distraction. And, and what I believe is Americans in their inner turmoil of life, in their spirit, they're restless. They're un, unfulfilled. They're unhappy. So they're seeking some distraction for a couple of hours that will take them away from uh, what God wants them to face reality. Amen? And, uh, you know, Ravi Zacharias says, in the childhood years, wonder can be obtained by dabbling in fantasy. But as the years pass, wonder is eroded in the face of reality and in recognition that life may not be lived in a fairy tale world. A displacement is brought about by the ever-increasing demand for the mind for what is true. Deep in us, there is a wiring to know what is true. And the followers of Jesus are lovers of truth, followers of truth. You know, we all say, I love Jesus. People tell me, I love Jesus. Well, good. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. So that means if I'm a lover of Jesus, I'm a lover of truth because he is truth. It's another name for him. St. Basil of, of Russia said, to lovers of the truth, nothing can be put before God and hope in him. This is not a new idea. I'm not bringing you some novelty. I'm not bringing you some heavy rebbe that no one has ever seen before. Actually, I wish we could get back to some of the roots that made the church strong at one point. Uh, the great English philosopher and physician John Locke wrote about how the purifying effect of the truth makes our lives better. He said, to love the truth for truth's sake is the principal part of human perfection in this world. And it's the seed plot of all other virtues. Once we make up our, our commitment to lifelong pursuit of the truth, as we do that, there's a working of virtue into other virtues begin to come forth. When we say, I want to follow the Spirit, I hear people say, well, I, want to, I just want to follow the Spirit. Well, okay, well, where's he leading? He said he'll lead you into all the truth. You know, a lot of times people say, well, I'm just trying to follow the Spirit. I followed the Spirit. I follow. And usually they're talking about, they hardly ever mean I'm, he, I'm following him into truth. And that's where he's leading. Okay? Beloved, Gary DeMar said, truth is the very heart of the Christian faith. It's like a wise man who builds on the rock. We're building our lives on the truth or a lie. And biblical worldview means that we're committed to see the world and everything in it, from education to economics to the arts, uh, to sports, uh, to uh, the news, to politics, to government. We see it all through the prism of the Word of God. We have a worldview that's comprehensive because the Word is true may surprise you that the search for truth, people say, well, where would I begin? Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. In Proverbs 1, 7, he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the beginning of knowledge. True knowledge or knowledge of the truth begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, some people say, well, I don't, thought, I don't have a spirit of fear. I'm not talking about the spirit of fear, talking about the fear of the Lord. Fear doesn't mean cowering back because he's going to hurt us. It means respect. It means reverence. And we've lost that in the church. 
listen, I want to be, I don't want a formal religious approach to God, but let me tell you something. Sometimes in our culture, folks, you know, God is my co-pilot, you know, on people's car bumper. You know, I just, I went up to one guy one time. He had God is my co-pilot on his bumper. I said, you know, you got that wrong, dude. God is the pilot. He's not the co-pilot. I mean, he built the plane, made the plans, put the gas in the engine. I mean, <laughs> if anybody's a co-pilot, it's you. And you're not even really that. If you're smart, you're in the back, sitting and buckled up in the seat, trusting God to take you where he wants you to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Then a few chapters later in Proverbs 9, 10, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One, understanding. Beloved, we need knowledge, wisdom, and truth. And it begins uh, with the fear of the Lord. Knowledge, wisdom. There is a difference, by the way, between knowledge and wisdom. I, I like to say knowledge is knowing something, and wisdom is the knowledge of knowing what to do with it. There's a lot of people that know a lot of things, but they're not wise. There are educated idiots. I mean, I've met people that have degrees after their name, and they know a lot of things and have knowledge of a lot of subjects, but they have no wisdom on how to live. Truth and knowledge and wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord and the authority of the word. The late Greg Bonson said, our apologetic, meaning our defense of the gospel, in other words, our worldview, must presuppose the authority and truth of Christ's word in Scripture, casting down all reasoning that exalts itself against God. And we're surrounded today with a lot of voices that are preaching not the truth. And there are things that come into even the minds of the best Christian and their thoughts and ideas and, and concepts that are all around us through the media and all kinds of advertising. And we have to be disciples of Jesus and be on our game so that when those thoughts come, we cast down those imaginations. The biblical worldview understands this. Everything the Bible says is true, number one. Everything that God says in his word is true. Second, nothing that contradicts what the Bible says can possibly be true. I don't care if it's a scientist a historian, a geologist, or a philosopher. God's word is true. Anything that contradicts his word cannot be true, no matter what arguments they present to you. And here I want to take a few minutes, and, and because I know most of you know what I've said, but I want to go another way here in a minute. And I want to bring you something that I, I don't know that you've heard that may help you. Uh, the biblical worldview begins with God and the fear of the Lord, beginning of knowledge and truth. There are different levels of truth. And I'm just using some examples. Two plus two equals four is true, right? That's the truth. Uh, you can prove it uh, empirically uh, through logic and, and rationality. Um, but at a more complicated level, Albert Einstein paved the way for the nuclear age when he discovered how to release atomic energy using a very simple formula, E equals MC squared. Now, you just look at that little formula right there. Those two plus two equals four is simple. That took a genius to find how to release atomic power. By the way, that means energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. That's what it means. Genius. But it's true. But here's what I want you to want to, I was spending a few minutes on this. That is not truth that will save us, but it is true. And what, what we have not been taught in modern cultural America is that all truth is God's truth. If it's true, it's from God. And it doesn't really 
uh, matter whether it's even in the Bible or not. Two plus two is not in the Bible. E equals MC squared is certainly not in the Bible. But these are truths that we can use to make our lives better and more livable. And what I'm, what I'm saying is, I mean, the first grader discovers the truth that two plus two is four, but a genius discovers e equals MC squared. But if you have a biblical worldview, you see God is the origin and the basis and the source of all that truth, even truth that's not in the Bible, because all truth is God's truth. And again, this isn't new with me, and it's been taught in the church, but it's just not taught in the church today at an hour when we really need it. The biblical worldview does not limit the pursuit of truth to strictly biblical truth. Way back in the fifth century, the great St. Augustine, or St. Augustine, said, a person who is a true and good Christian should realize that truth belongs to his Lord wherever it is found. Gathering and acknowledging it even in pagan literature, but rejecting vain and superstitious vanities and deploring those who, though they knew God, did not glorify him as God. What he's saying is you can find truth which is God's truth, even in pagan literature, and receive and learn from that truth without approving or accepting fellowship with the one who wrote it. Oh, Augustine also said, all truth and understanding is, is a result of a divine light, of divine light, which is God himself. The biblical worldview never denies that non-Christian people can have some of the truth. But all the glory for the truth they have has to go to God. Last quote from him. By the way, he died in 430 AD. Nay, but let every good and true Christian understand that wherever truth may be found, it belongs to his master. A thousand years later, after Augustine, the great reformer John Calvin said it this way, all truth is from God. And consequently, if wicked men have said anything that is true and just, we ought not reject it, for it has come from God. You know, the Holy Spirit has guided me over the years into so much truth that did not come even from Christian minds. Uh, but I always give God the glory when I find truth wherever I find it, because all truth is God's truth. I used to, uh, all the, through the years, you know, most of you know, I didn't go in the ministry until I was 43 years old. I, went in the, I didn't go to college. I went into the business world right out of high school at 18 years old. So you do the math, 25 years. I was in the business world before I became a minister. And when, when I got saved and, uh, and then was walking with Jesus as a businessman, I was reading the, the great business books. And when I got saved, I went to the church and I had these Christian businessmen, I said, what, what are you reading? Oh, well, I'm reading Moby Dick or I'm, you know, I'm reading uh, Peyton Place or whatever. I don't know. And I say, aren't you reading these? Well, I just read the Bible. Well, that's why you not have more money. <laughs> Do you have any idea of the, um, of the truth that is out there in these business books that are being written? And those, those truths are God's truths. Hallelujah. Mm. Calvin said, therefore, in reading profane authors, the admirable light of truth displayed in them should remind us that the human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still adorned and invested with admirable gifts from its creator. If we reflect and know that the Spirit of God is the only fountain of truth, we will be careful as we would avoid offering insult to him not to reject or condemn truth wherever it appears. I almost feel like I need to warn you. I'm not saying you don't be careful what you read. But I know Christians who are so careful about what they read, they don't read anything. They don't even they don't read the Bible. 
But I'm just saying the Bible is the primary source of all truth, but you can find truth if you're a lifelong seeker of it in places other than the Bible. 400 years after Calvin, the great Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavink said this, God is the truth in its absolute fullness. God, therefore, is the primary, the original truth, and the source of all truth. The truth in all truth. He is the ground of the truth. The ideal of all ethical being, of all the rules and laws, the light by which things should be judged and on which they should be modeled. God is the source of the origin of the knowledge of truth in all areas of life. If we know that all truth is God's truth, we don't need to be afraid of the truth no matter where it comes from. Hallelujah. Woe to us when someone comes with truth and because they may not be a Christian, we have no way to engage them or accept even the good part of what they're presenting because we haven't had the courage to face that other person with with. with this kind of a worldview that understands these kind of things. Now, I'm just going to take an all truth is God's truth. You got that? Okay. All right. That's one I want you to take home with you because as you meditate on just that simple phrase, I believe the Lord is going to really set you free <clears throat> in a whole lot of areas and a whole lot of ways. And I'll just, while I'm at it, the, there's a problem with us Pentecostals. Uh, I had a Pentecostal encounter with the Holy Spirit in 1972. I do not apologize for being a Pentecostal any more than I used to apologize for being a Baptist. A Pentecostal person might accuse the non-Pentecostal person of being hyper-intellectual. Pentecostals will say, well, those, those people that don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, Man, they're just, they're just not with it. I mean, they're just, they just don't have what we have. And, of course, the, the uh, non-Pentecostal person looks at the Pentecostals and accuses us of being uh, hyper-emotional and experience-driven. Have you ever heard that? The problem is, in some cases, both of them are correct. I mean, hallelujah. I know some very smart theologians and non-Pentecostals who could use a good blast of the Holy Spirit. But I know a whole lot of Pentecostal people who could use a good blast of the truth and a good foundational theology and worldview that could put them in a position and in a firm ground to stand in this world with something more than speaking tongues at it, as wonderful as that can be. Since I'm a Pentecostal on this side of the aisle, let me offer some self-criticism to us. We often do neglect the need for solid theology and biblical foundations. The truth is we need both. We do tend to see the Holy Spirit more as one who gives us gifts than the one who guides us into all truth. I put that to you. You ask most of us, What's the first thing you think about as far as having the Holy Spirit? Gifts of the Spirit, miracles, healing, speaking in tongues, manifestations, power. That's all correct. But very few uh, Pentecostals would say, he guides us into all truth. Think about that one. We sometimes forget that God not only saves our souls, but he saves our minds. J.I. Packer said the gospel does in truth proclaim the redemption of reason or the mind. All truth is God's truth. Facts as such are sacred, and nothing is more unchristian than to run away from them. And again, some truth is not really important. I mean, you can go to heaven and not know two plus two is four. It's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> Let's keep that right. Keith Matheson said the truths that are not found in the Bible, like your date of birth, the structure of protein molecules, are not necessary for salvation. But they're still truth. But all truth is from God. 
I don't know if you've ever read Jonathan Edwards. Honestly, Jonathan Edwards was an amazing pastor during the Great First Awakening in America. Encyclopedia Britannica called Jonathan Edwards, a Christian pastor, the greatest intellectual mind America has ever produced. Think about that praise. He, he's a genius. He said, all truth is given by revelation, either general or special. Now, what he means by that is that general revelation is 2 plus 2 equals 4, MC, uh, M equals uh, MC squared, uh, the rotation of the planets, the study of the ologies, biology, uh, mineralogy, all the different uh, ologies that are out there. Those are, those are truths. Uh, that's, that's what we call natural revelation. It's, it's there. It can be figured out. When he refers to special revelation, he's talking about revelation of Scripture, which is when God reveals through his word. That's special revelation. Okay? I uh, don't know if I did good on that. All truth is given by revelation, general or special, and must be received by the reasoning mind. Reason is the God-given means for discovering the truth that God discloses, whether in his word or in his world. When God, While God wants us to reach the heart with the truth, he does not bypass the mind. There are millions of books that contain amazing truth but remain unread out of ignorance or laziness or fear. I mean, I've been doing this now since 84 when I went in the ministry, and I've, you know, I've always had a heart for Christian businessmen because I always felt like as a Christian businessman, my pastor didn't get me. You know, I, 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 and he was, I had great pastors. I have nothing bad to say about them. But I have to tell you, even though I supported and I gave my tithes and my offerings and I worked in the church, door greeter, teach Sunday school class, I was always busy, but I didn't feel like he really got me. I felt like the pastor lives in a kind of a, a pastoral world. He's over here in the spiritual world, and I'm out here kind of in the real world. And uh, we meet on Sunday. And uh, that's not, that, that's just the way I felt. So when I became a pastor, you know, I have this heart, you know, to connect on a practical level, understanding that, 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 that people, most of your people, you know, you're going to get up Monday morning and pray. They're going to do what you did for all those years. They're going to go to work. They go out in the real world with real people, ugly people, bad people sometimes. And so I wanted to be relevant to them. And so when I would, when I would, and, and I ran into this, I would say, uh, the business books, you know, uh, it was back in the 80s, the, one of the greatest books, uh, I think, ever. And it wasn't just for business people. Uh, it was used as a business book, but it was a, it was a book for anybody. It was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It is a classic. Now, this is a book. It's not a Christian. And, you know, here, let me get, get ahead of myself. And I would have men say, I'm not going to read that because it's written by a Mormon. Yes, Stephen Covey is a Mormon. And uh, we'll have a worldview study of the cults, and you'll see that it's, it's, it's a cult. They have a different Jesus, okay? Many of them are good people. Many of them are honest people. And many of them acknowledge Jesus Christ in some way, but it's a different Jesus, okay? But I am going to tell you, this man, Stephen Covey, has wrote a masterpiece. Those seven habits of highly effective people, if you know the Bible, you can take every one of them and find biblical support for every one of those. And I promise you, if you can learn the seven habits and live the seven habits, you will be an effective person in everything. It's just a help. But how many millions of missed the blessing of the truth in that because it was written by a Mormon? Well, Hallelujah. I never know if these are going over or not. Pew, you know, just pew. Who's this? <laughs> I, just, I just run it up the flagpole, and if nobody salutes it, I pull it down and throw something else up there. <laughs> okay. How much more successful could we be if we understood the Holy Spirit? One of his jobs 
is to guide me into all truth. I need to be a truth seeker, a truth lover. And I need to see that God can get that his truths to me through many, many things. I mean, there, there are some movies that they're not Christian movies, but they have themes. And I can see biblical themes and teaching that comes through. And I have to tell you, I believe sometimes the people that made the movie didn't may not even intend for it to, but it comes through. How do you know? The Holy Spirit shows us. Now that, son, that is a truth. That is a truth. And I could give you examples, but I won't. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. So <laughs> Jesus promised, let me close. Number one, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And I'll remind you, point one was nothing identifies true followers of Christ more than their commitment to a lifelong pursuit of truth. Number two, the biblical worldview is comprehensive. It means seeing the world in it and everything in it through Scripture because all truth is God's truth. The Spirit guides us into all truth. All truth is God's truth. And the last thing I want to say is how do we handle this, what we heard tonight? And I have a couple of tips. <sighs> because knowing things, you know, the Bible says knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge can puff you up. You know, when people are successful or they think they know a lot, they can get into a pride and when the Holy Spirit starts showing you something and giving you revelation and maybe that other people, not many have, and it's, it's just real easy for the enemy to come in there and, and puff you up, you know, have to be careful with that. First Corinthians 8, 2 helps me. Paul said, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet, as he ought to know. <laughs> I love that. Some of us say, well, I know that. Well, he says, if you think you know it, you don't know it as you ought to know it. Because when I say I know that, in my mind, if enough I don't say it, I'm always thinking, but I got so much more to learn, even about that. Amen? There's a measure for truth. True truth, as one called it. John Piper said, all truth exists to make God known, to make God loved, and to make God shown. If it does not have those three effects, it is not known rightly and should not be celebrated as a virtue. It's a good test. We have to seek the truth knowing that we never are going to know it all. You've heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial, the famous trial here in Tennessee where the school teacher, you know, over, the, over evolution and teaching creation in the, in the schools, and on one side you had the great... Uh, uh, Oliver Wendell, Wendell Holmes, right? And on the other side, you had Clarence Darrow, who was a Christian. And uh, Clarence Darrow loved God, believed in creation. Some people say he lost the debate, but he said something real wise. He said, the pursuit of truth will set you free, even if you never catch up with it even if you'd never catch up with it. I've been pursuing truth. You know, this is something about hardwired for truth. Before I was even saved, I had this inquiring mind. I just wanted to know truth. I couldn't, wouldn't have defined it that way, but it just got worse when I got saved. But all this time, I know that the farther I go, the more you say, so, well, you know a lot. I, the more I know, the more I know I'm stupid. I don't know anything as I ought to know. I walk in my office. Somebody came to my office the other day, and they, you know, I got 3,000 books in that study. And they walk in there, and they said, man, man. And I said, it doesn't mean a thing. I said, look, I should be smarter. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way I look at it. I, with all these books, I should be smarter. But the, but. But the truth is, I'm after it. I'm after it. I'm a lifelong learner. That's what a disciple is. He's a learner. And that, that's the way we always want to be. 
And God forbid, as we do these series, that a lot of it is cerebral, a lot of it is, is deals with the mind. You know, people forget that we're, we're people who believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. It just so happens God's got us on this track right now. But the fact is, we have to be recognizing what we need to win the war of the worldviews. And I, I'm telling you right now, we don't need a, thousand, ten, a, a million man march up in Washington where we, a million people stand outside the White House and speak in tongues. What we need is some people equipped to fight the spiritual battle of the philosophies that are trying to destroy the country. Now, I'll close with a wonderful word from, I just say we need to have the apostolic purpose of the Apostle Paul, and this is my last. Paul said to the Colossian church, my purpose is that you may be united in heart and united in love so that you may have the full riches of complete understanding to know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. To pursue Christ is to pursue the one that hidden in him is all wisdom and all knowledge. All truth belongs to God. Amen.